Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. session of the 2019 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are happy to introduce a presentation called Guinevere, Learn a Language Through Games in Virtual Worlds. Our speaker is Hiker, Hiker Philp from the Guinevere Project. And Hiker is the CEO of Let's Talk Online, SBRL, an immersive education specialist for language learning and teaching. She's a co-initiator of the EU-founded Lancelot Virtual Classroom and the Avalon Virtual World and the Camelot Project for Machinima for Language Learners. And then, of course, <clears throat> the Guinevere, the games in virtual worlds. She's also the founder of the Virtual Roundtable Conference, and she co-owns EduNation and Second Life. Her partners on this project were unable to join us today. That's Michael Thomas, Tansir Khan, um, Leticia uh, Chingat. Chiganato, uh, and of course, Nick Zwart, and we heard from them last year. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for speaker bios, details of the sessions, and the full schedule of events. The session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send your tweets to at opensimcc with the hashtag pound OSCC19. Welcome everyone, let's begin the session. Over to you, Hiker. Thank you so much, Leah, for introducing me and thank you everyone for being here. I'm very delighted. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the presentation about Guinevere, an EU funded project which has successfully finished last month after two years of working with a consortium of five project partners to develop the expertise on how to build language learning games in virtual worlds. The project partners unfortunately could not make it, <clears throat> so I'm here to represent the team. And since we do have a little time spare, I'd like to ask the audience if, hi, <laughs> it's lovely to see you. I'd like to ask the audience for helping me to brainstorm how to learn a language in the world. And for this brainstorming, I would have prepared a document which I'm going to share with you in the audience now. And it's been also shared on the live stream. And uh, if you could help me just answer a very few questions, uh, that little survey just like how many languages do you speak? You can also type here this in the text chat. Um, how many languages do you speak? Which language would you want to learn? Um, yeah, exactly. And perhaps why would you want to learn it or how would you want to learn it? And then we will do a brainstorming session. Whilst you are filling in this short survey, perhaps even write something in the brainstorming session, I would like to present to you what Guinevere was all about. This may take approximately 15 minutes. So you have 15 minutes to fill in the survey and perhaps Oh, Leah is speaking one language. Thank you so much. <laughs> <clears throat> and then we, I will come back to your answers. Hold your answers for now, if that's okay. Hold your answers for now, because in 15 minutes' time after the presentation, we will look at these surveys and do a bit of brainstorming. Is that okay? But you can write in the Google Docs already if you like. So, back to the presentation. Allow me to present our project partners. We had University of Central Lancashire in the UK with a, really a fantastic project coordinator, Dr. Michael Thomas, and his team, Sylvia Benini, Crystal Schneider, and Carol Rainbow, and others at the university. And um, we also had uh, in the project as our partner, 
University of Istanbul. University of Istanbul had a special kind of setup with an English department and a computer department next to each other, closely collaborating on Guinevere under the lead of Dr. Tundra Khan, Irfan Timzek, Mustafa Ilkham, who is a fantastic programmer and an app designer, and um, Marilyn Tetula and others in the team, especially their many teacher trainees who learned to become English teachers. Then we were blessed with having the Italian University line with Dr. Letizia Cinganotto, Andrea Benassi, Conceta Russo, and an incredibly well-trained team of teachers who are working in research of using Minecraft and OpenSim. And they're amazing, I tell you. And then we were really, really blessed to have Nick Swart work with us from and his company is called 3D Learning Experience Services in the Netherlands. He's an amazing programmer, a builder, a scripter, OpenSim developer, and he's also helped to install and maintain our Minecraft server. I'll talk about the different environments in a minute. Finally, myself, Heike Phil, let's talk online, SPL in Brussels, I've been an immersive language learning expert for more than a decade, and I managed to co-initiate a total of four year funded projects since 2005. These projects focused on language learning in real time via the internet using virtual classroom technology and virtual worlds. They're called Lancelot, Avalon, Camelot, and Guinevere runs in that line. It's important for the project description. And also I run the Virtual Round Table Conference, been doing it since 2009. So, and now, we get to, sorry, this just the next slide. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I hope you see it, okay. <clears throat> we spent two years in the following 3D, uh, three virtual environments, Minecraft, and because that's from six year old, OpenSim, learners from 10 year olds, and Second Life, which caters for learners from 16 plus onwards, we, as we know, and it's been um, a basic lead for adults. Until now, we were only able to cater for adults. But now, these two new environments opened the way for younger learners. New to us was Minecraft. We spent extensive time in Minecraft. We also had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, there was more time spent in OpenSim. That was really a great experience because OpenSim has improved so much in quality and we were surprised how rich and beautiful it is. Nick Swart built Guinevere Islands for us. He set up two regions, well it, it was a total of four regions, sorry. He set up two regions with an orientation pass, some close newbies, castles, round table halls, medieval village, a team game island and some gaming analy analytics in the database for the team game island. Uh, he did fantastic. He also these islands were uh, hypergrid enabled and still available until February 2020 under the following address, world.guinevereproject.eu 8002, uh, double dot, sorry, oh, 8002. Afterwards, we will use the OAR files, but we do not know where to go as of yet. But I do want to keep maintaining these beautiful islands. They're so wonderful. Euclid added to this a region for role-playing sim with several hotels designed for role-playing, hotel conversation, to include check-in or complaints about unhygienic conditions, really fun stuff, you know, big spiders in the rooms and stuff. On the Sky Deck, there were a number of scenes for machinima role-play, such as a bar, a catwalk for fashion shows, a theme park, an artistic workshop, airport check-in areas, and they were designed for machine, but also for providing copyable objects for our trainees. Mm -hmm. 
Nick also for now, but sorry if that was the slide too quick rather. <laughs> um, Nick also provided our Minecraft server. Oh yes, sorry, that was Minecraft. So yeah, that's it. Um, Nick provided the uh, the Minecraft server, and you can spend a lot of time on preparing activities for the kids. These included escape room type games, bridal paths to pick up words of the week, roller coasters, etc. But I'm saying a big but. Sorry, I'm not designed to go that far. But the kids did not really take them on. We found that this did not really capture the interest of the kids. They preferred to build, script, use potions. Res, mine, and this at a pace and ingenuity which simply left us baffled. Some of the activities designed by teachers for the field tests were very successful. When teachers let the youngsters rebuild fairy tales like Hensel and Gretel or the Three Little Piglets, which was greatly successful even with the young ones, the very young ones. And then we did have a games park in Second Life. We also had some project partners who created special games for that. Riddles, escape room type houses, etc. But the activities were very limited and only really taken up by the participants of the self-study course because for the teacher trip, yeah, escape rooms. For the teacher-led course, we decided to stay in open sim. <coughs> Now we come to the outcomes of the project. EU funding means that everything which has been developed during the project is freely available. And I proudly pr provide or present these giveaways. Leo, can you perhaps type this URL in the text chat? It's slash deliverables. And these are called IOs or intellectual outputs. And some of them are really, really outstanding. One of them is a brilliant work done by Crystal Schneider, who worked as research assistant for Yuklan. She created a document called IL4 Categorizing of Games, which, where she lists numerous games with images of their in-world builds. <laughs> Try it, yes, thank you. She investigates their goal, teaching objective, skills required. Then she lists the CEFR framework elements like speaking, listening, production, etc. Created a table with categories for listening, speaking, conversation, spoken productions, like announcement or speeches, reading and writing. Absolutely stunning. Very detailed, she also added, she looked at other categories like narrative, recounting something, guessing, questions and answers, socializing and collaborative activities, or just for fun. This document alone, which spans about 70 pages, is a treasure and you get it from the URL mentioned above. All of them are outstanding, yes. Um, there's fantastic documents on the IO2, um, IO1 theory of game design. There's a meta study on gamification studies, a game design of global simulation, a village report, again with lots of games, but more of a historical document. Guidelines for language teachers on security. Sorry, I've not actually listed them in the Speak Easy Hub, but check it out. So now, this brings me to the highlights of the project, a teacher training course on how to build games. And there is a, there's two types of courses, one of which is a self-study course, and the other one is a teacher-led course. The self-study course is freely available in Moodle, and the teacher-led course will be offered commercially as from next year onwards. 
again, learn.quinniverproject.eu. Um, third chance, you can paste this URL. Sorry, being unprepared. <clears throat> then we do have an app, which is fantastic, developed by University of Central uh, Istanbul, sorry, by Mustafa. It's called Gistory, and it's not history misspelled, it's Gistory, sort of, uh, yeah. Uh, the Gistory app is designed to take images that teachers provide, and the images would be images from in-world or other um, narratives or whatever, and you can build little stories that are interactive, which request or require the learners to, at one point, it didn't work, okay. <clears throat> hmm. It should work, it should still be around. Greenville project, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and the uh, the app itself have, is free. You can edit the app on the mobile device, add shots, add images, add activities, add little stories or chunks that could then be framed in an interactive story type app. Beautiful. It will be out on the Play Store very soon. And the Play Store will be um, the uh, Google Play Store and the iOS version. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Steve. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Lovely, Leah. Leah types, she wanted an interactive session. So you're doing well, contributing the links. <laughs> Fantastic. So allow me just to spend a couple of minutes in uh, showing you what kind of type of games were developed in the pilot project. So the one at the top left, the small image that you see with the poles, the UK poles sticking out, is a map of the UK with these poles indicating cities of the UK. The interesting thing about this, it was designed and created in Blender and then imported into OpenSim by one of our language educators who is here in the audience. <laughs> And yeah, Lux, Lucia, amazing. She learned all this Blender stuff in crafts. Yeah, right? You're such an amazing language educator. Amazing look. So, and uh, what does that map do? It's uh, the top of map is created in Blender and imported into OpenSim. The game is dynamic and bumping into the cylinders triggers a script that names the city. Interacting with a map helps students complete these web-based activities. <laughs> Clever, fun, and effective. Ingenious. <laughs> then we had an Alice in Wonderland hand and image sort. <laughs> a wonderful Cheshire Cat-based hand and image sorting exercise that tests understanding of the storyline by asking the students to sort the images from the original illustrations in order. Then we had a board game, <clears throat> a hand-drawn game with a variety of elements. And this game is notable both for the hand-drawn board and the variety of different types of activities to engage the students in language practice. The variety of where they uh, design tasks, including listening comprehension using embedded video and audio clips, would keep any class engaged. The bottom right, you see a mysterious forest maze. The mysterious forest maze is a great example of how important setting the stage is in the virtual world. This is a very inviting woodland walk peppered with clues and puzzles to be discovered and solved along the way. The same puzzles in a more basic maze design 
without the forest theme would still be fun, but probably not have the same impact. Then we see a memory game. This memory game is an example of what can be done with a traditional game in a virtual world that couldn't be done in the classroom. As soon as the student matches the correct image, the game tells the player in chat that is correct. If incorrect, the cards quickly revert to face side down to indicate the student needs to try again. And here at the bottom right, we see the Bank of Japan simulation. This role-playing game allows players to interact with bot tellers to ask for help and the right forms. To interact with the ATM machines to practice, recognizing which buttons need to be pressed to initiate different transactions. <clears throat> Which is a great reality-based simulation, provides a wonderful practice opportunity. I also, sorry, I don't have a uh, an image for that. We also had um, an academic research game designed by two participants to be played by teams of player. Beautifully interesting was that what, it was in a language learning activity. It was uh, based on a pyramid and you actually had to walk up along a path to get to the very top. And the activities included several challenges, but also fun stuff, like sometimes the bot would actually just be allowed to stand and be animated for a dance. Most outstanding, and I tell you, this was so impressive. We had, we had unfortunately only one participant in Minecraft, but that person seemed to spend the nights in Minecraft. She designed a game in Minecraft that is almost on the basis of an adventure type game. It was, you had to, you, you entered a house, see that at the very top a little bit, you entered a house and in the house, you had to really look for clues. And the thought of it was that Dr. Moreau was missing. So nowhere to be found. And eventually, you could find some clues that would let you know that there is some location in the basement of that house. Now, even to find the staircase downstairs, which was under the carpet, was not as easy. I think I would have spent a good hour just in the house looking for uh, the next path, which is what the idea is in an adventure type of game. Team playing game as well, so an escape room type of game. Very good. So the, the, then you went into the basement of that house. This lab was filled with strange creatures. And the whole lab was filled with mobs and skeletons and spiders and um, squids. And if you landed in the water, you got killed. If you accidentally opened one of the creatures, then you got killed. So the whole lab, lab in the basement was so strange, but it put you in the frame of mind that this Dr. Moreau had a strange way of working with these creatures, or he was producing creatures, or taming creatures, or whatever, whatever. It was gory as can be. Now, eventually, after a lot of trying to search for clues, you then would be led to, again, a ladder which goes very down. And in this... Um, but in the, in the last basement, you'd find a portal to the nether. And then through that portal, you were, you know, you ended up in Neverland. And then, and that's where you find Dr. Moreau sitting in a cage. The adventure type game itself was so, yeah, absolutely. And the adventure type game uh, was so sophisticated and it also included all of these builds, 
So the house needed to be built, the basement needed to be built, the creatures needed to be arrested, <laughs> or tamed, or caught, or, or, or whatever, whatever. The squids, and, and it was so funny. Add. It was absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning. This is the power of Minecraft. We were uh, all. So this is just an impression of what uh, we learned what we had to, yeah, what we um, uh, experienced in the, um, in uh, this virtual world and uh, in the Gwyneth project. So what we have for you, the audience, is a lot of giveaways with the deliverables, the IOs, that you can freely download from the website. What we have for you is the self-study course. What we have for you is even an app. And I invite you all to take it up. But now, we'd like to do a little bit of a brainstorming session. We do have, for this, about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to do. Um, it was mentioned uh, above in the one big, is it, so if you go to the www.winningerproject.eu website and then click on deliverables. And there you will find the whole list of the so-called IOs, which are the intellectual outputs, starting from AO1, IO1, which is the uh, theory of game design study, a beautiful study, a meta-study on a gamification document. <laughs> so this star Farah asks, uh, he says, I'd like to apply this approach to learning Icelandic in space pioneer script with a pathway to Old Norse. Now, this brings us beautifully to the uh, uh, challenge which I would like to give you, which is a Google Docs inviting you to think about how you would like to learn a language in virtual worlds. And I'm turning my attention to the Google Docs already. And the first question that we asked was, how many languages do you speak? And we see it's an anonymous survey. So we see that a three and a one and a one and a half, one and a half, that's lovely. Two active and two more passive ones. Then we see a lot of one, 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 ones. And one person put down the number four. So it's speaking four languages, that is amazing. And we see another number two. So that was just to get an idea of the audience of how many languages do you speak? Because we do have an American-based audience mostly. And if you did that survey in Europe, then you would come to different results. So now the big question is, which language would you like to learn? That was question number two. You wrote down, thank you so much for filling in this already amazing <clears throat> Spanish, six, German, two, Portuguese. Oh, somebody's actually, somebody's actually collected already the subtotals. That's wonderful. So six people in the audience said they would love to learn Spanish. Two said they would love to learn German, one Portuguese, one Serbian, one Japanese, one Russian, one Hindi, and one Icelandic. I guess that was you. Steve, that's the Starfara. Sorry, Starfara wants to learn Icelandic. Fantastic. So why would you want to learn this language? <laughs> because China may rule the world is one of the reasons. Oh, it's important to know the reasons. So, and... <laughs> near Mexico, that's why you would like to learn Spanish, that's fantastic. Another reason is mentioned, because Austria is so close to where I stay, so some person wants to learn German. Um, one of the reasons also mentioned was, I know many Spanish speakers, that would be lovely to speak Spanish, fantastic. Um, Another person mentioned to speak with family who lives in Serbia. And these ideas were written down from the beginning of this talk, basically half an hour ago. Thank you so much for filling in this Google Docs in whilst I was presenting about uh, Guinevere. <clears throat> so another reason is given, 
I like to connect with people, ideas, cultures from around the world. And I just enjoy the process of learning a language. Oh, that's a lovely, lovely thought. It is one of the primary languages spoken in our state, which is the US. I have many friends and colleagues in Brazil. I would like to do to more easily interact with them and then when traveling in Brazil, so that Brazil is Portuguese. Spanish is becoming a de facto second language in the US uh, to learn Old Norse, the Viking language. Um, brings me to the thought, in Duolingo, you can learn Klingon. Have, did you know that? <laughs> to participate in, sometimes it's just fun, you know. To participate in diplomatic and scientific developments for the world's largest developing population in India. That is here. Wonderful. And we're still, people still fill this in. That is amazing. Um, I'd like to also encourage you to fill, well, to write things down if you want here in private chat, um, sorry, in public chat. Um, happy to read this for you. Hey, Hiker, we had a yep. question from Lisa. Have you made considerations for people with speech or hearing disabilities in language learning and include both audio and visual cues for every aspect of the virtual world games? That is a fantastic uh, question, Lisa. Ask that. Sorry, who asked that? Going to miss it. Oh, yes, Lisa asked that. Have you made considerations for people with speech and hearing disabilities? Um, we have not actually catered for what we call special educational needs, SEN, and in the project that was never a topic. Um, basically, the answer is no. <laughs> But I would like to check this out, Lisa. I'd like to sort of um, also perhaps consult with Crystal because she was the one who did a variety of uh, games categorization. Perhaps she has come across some who would cater for one or the others, for those visually impaired or auditive impaired. Is that okay if I come back to you on this one, Lisa? Thank you so much. Now, I'm turning again my attention to the Google Docs, but I would also like to, um, well, the, the next question was, why do you want to la learn a language was one of the questions, but the next question, equally interesting, is how would you like to learn a language? Now, immersion and lessons, immersion, books and videos is mentioned, immersion, immersion with speakers, Immersion definitely is mentioned a lot through participating in 3D immersive communities, uh, immersion games and virtual worlds TV. Prefer immersion, virtual worlds more practical, immersion with speakers, my word. A variety of technologies, games sounds a fun way, but also with help. Awesome, awesome. And more is mentioned now under the brainstorming session, but let me stop this here and just to turn my attention again to the uh, public chat here in World to pick up some of the comments. We were mostly talking about accessibility and then I repasted the Google Doc link for those who are joining the session in progress or you're on the live stream link and you're wondering where are we, um, we're looking at this shared document. Back to you, Hiker. And I think um, some of the volunteers in the background are also helping me collect this information from the live stream because we want to also hear from the folks who might not have made it in work but are interested in what's happening here. So, and I'm just picking up a comment in the live, in the public chat. When I visited Venezuela, I remember the signed alphabet different from the American Sign Languages alphabet. And for the... Da, da, da. Well, the reason I commented that was Lisa was asking about accessibility and languages. And I know that at, in the Guinevere project, you were thinking you had a lot of diverse uh, folks and languages. And I remember from the conferences, because I've spoken at the virtual roundtable conferences, 
that what was beautiful about this is how culture and society and language and gaming and behavior all came together. So Lisa's question about accessibility is critical. And when I thought about something like the sign language for accessibility, and of course one of my students worked on a sign language interpreter where you could gesture with your hands and it, a camera would a connect essentially would interpret what you were gesturing and then it would translate it over to an app that would wow. then sign. It would do text messaging for you. And then he was working on a Second Life component for it or an OpenSIM component for it because we were using open source. But uh, the notion of bringing that into the virtual world, and of course our challenge was having enough fidelity for the fingers, right, for the gestures to be able to do that. But So when I think of language and I think of, like when I traveled to Venezuela, I didn't speak the language when I went. And, of course, some folks were a little hostile to Americans, so I had to be quiet, right? And I'm never quiet, <laughs> those of you who know me. <laughs> so I started signing, not realizing that our signs are different. And, of course, oh! they started teaching me, yeah, on the fly, because I was there for two months with no credit card and $75 in my pocket. So I was, I was living with family and traveling cross-country, and I had to be smuggled because, of course, um, like I said, they weren't really happy. But I, but I was determined to experience life and language at the heart of it. And, of course, that was an eye-opener. So for Lisa's question, even our sign language is different. And, of course, across America, every city has like two or three dialects. But, um, but even the basic language for the alphabet is different as we go to other countries. So I noticed that, and, and I think that's an important point. Back to you, Hiker. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. What an experience. And thank you so much for just that thought, sign language that can be interpreted. Lovely, lovely thought. I'm also looking forward to once the voice recognition is so far as that you can put a mobile phone on a table with um, somebody who is hearing impaired and the others who aren't. Like they're chatting, they're just talking normally. And then the mobile phone would just transcribe what it hears for the person who is hearing impaired. That's the one thing I was really also looking forward to. But let's, um, let's take the thought of wanting to learn a language in an immersive environment. And here is what I would really, really like this fantastic audience to help me create because the question of what next is very important so I'm just going to show you what my dream is and I invite you to share your expertise now this is sorry a, a, a borrowed image of the Europa Park in Germany in Rost Uh, it is just it just symbolizes the kind of um, well language games park that I would like to create in open sim and a language games park would have like a corner for learning Spanish or a little tiny little village to learn Japanese or maybe a tea ceremony house to, to learn Japanese or it would be a Chinese uh, I don't know the great world to learn some time, just some visualization, obviously, of the culture. But I can also imagine that this open sim community that I'm seeing in front of me, the fantastic experts in designing, creating, scripting, um, game design experts like Leah is, for example, um, and educators of a magnitude that is way beyond of what we language educators could even even dream about perhaps even AI programmers who could contribute some chatbots to this uh, global village that I would like to create in OpenSIM so here's the image of the games park or the language games park that I would love to create for also perhaps in OpenSIM to be something like a magnet for newbies, for, for the public, for people like who, who just want to, to, to be around and perhaps 
watch a film in Spanish, maybe attend a tea ceremony in Japanese, maybe um, learn some Spanish samba <laughs> or Brazilian samba or Brazilian dancing or just do an author reading type of activity where somebody reads a book in English. So perhaps some of the librarians who are present here would like to contribute their expertise to this village or global village or language games part to um, provide what's known as what we call graded readers or some publications that are suitable for language learners. We can all contribute if you would like to share with me in doing this our designs, thoughts, ideas, experiences. We could start building, yes, Cyber Sorrenti, um, and perhaps we all bring together that which in OpenSim each of one has created as an educator and provided for their learners on their sims. These could be some chatbots, these could be um, something, but something to learn a language. Thank you, Bella, librarian. She, yeah, she speak up. Yes, culture, collaboration, but also perhaps simply something like get together. I would love to have this um, run events. So, for example, imagine this. Okay, Monday is the Japanese day. And then on Monday, we have lots of activities to learn Japanese. And everybody who is in the Japanese region, you know, this area of that uh, global village, is asked to either try to speak Japanese or try to understand Japanese. And all the language that's spoken is Japanese, if at all possible. Hopefully some translation tools will help us here. What about Spanish? Then on Tuesday, for example, we learn Spanish and all day we can immerse ourselves in this maybe Spanish village, in, in the global village, and then uh, speak Spanish, hear Spanish, listen to others speaking Spanish, watch some films doing Spanish, listen to radio stations Spanish, uh, speak with Spanish native speakers, <laughs> Contact with the Estonians for funding. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Sun Tzu provided that thought. <laughs> yeah, are oh, you wonderful? <laughs> I hope you join me in building this language games park. <laughs> I will invite the language educators in my team, I will invite those who will be the future trainees of Guinevere. I'll invite everybody who is in immersive <laughs> to provide uh, this cultural experience. So, so we are uh, close to ending. So I uh, thank you very much for, for helping me to brainstorm this. If you could perhaps continue on that Google Docs, and I would like to share then more um, links on that Google Docs that pertain to what we have already today. And this image of <laughs> it should be a copyrighted image, but uh, perhaps uh, just the thought. Now, questions to you at the audience. Please feel free to just mention what you think about it. So Sun adds a comment about this is why immersive learning may be the best for this. So now the question is, are there any questions from our audience or anything you'd like to add to this? Any thoughts from your experiences in the community? And while we're listening to our audience, I want to thank you, Hiker, for a fantastic session. Um, did you have anything you'd like to close with before we wrap? Um, yeah, I'm just waiting for some comments from the audience. Immersive learning is what I'm imagining. It would be wonderful to have, say, in the Italian part of that village, to have some speakers 
in uh, some English speakers who want to learn Italian and some German speakers who want to learn Italian and then mingle, uh, mingle in this area. Lisa, thank you for your input. Since you have you, no, I haven't talked to Rosetta Stone as of yet. No, but I might do. <laughs> I'm quite good in getting funding from the EU so far. Let's see what else we can <laughs> generate from the industry. Did you and see James those asked, comments? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, James asked a fantastic question. How do you think VR headsets would affect language learning? Well, if we could create these immersive experiences, so far I've heard yesterday that um, the possibility to export OpenSim to create um, immersive experiences in a Google Cardboard type of VR headset are still not multiplayer. And for language learning, you need multiplayer surroundings. We need to communicate. We need to talk to each other, listen to each other. So I would like to work on bringing people together with the same goal, the same goal of learning a specific language. And if I manage that, I would be very, very happy. Sun Tzu says it would be a great way to get more people in these environments, and I totally agree. That's my goal. I would love to see a lot more people here in this conference who are just here for the first time. Yes, there's some on the live stream, but not enough. We want people to listen to us. And your translator and AI ML server paths can combine Gimisa, says Lisa. I don't understand that very much, but she'll explain that to me. Well, we, we have, have one, one minute question. to go. Oh, right. sorry. Go ahead, Leah. I think we need to wrap on this last thought here. Um, Lux had asked about, since the Guinevere project is no longer funding, it, it's completed, what's in store for European teachers? Do you have an event that's coming up in January or February, or when's the next conference? Yes, we do have an event, and that's the EVO sessions from mid-January until mid-February. It's called Immersive Language Learning in Virtual Worlds, and it's a tour through various virtual worlds out there with the goal of evaluating those worlds for language learning affordances. Um, and we do tour all sorts from Minecraft, Second Life, OpenSim, various OpenSim regions, World of Warcraft, and even Fortnite. <laughs> so <Wait. laughs> I hope you enjoy. Come and join us for the Evo sessions. Uh, more to soon. Thank you, Hiker. Thank you. And I want to thank, thank you, you for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. And following this session, the next session will begin at 10.30 a.m. in this keynote region. And it is entitled, Into the Future Web-Based Virtual Worlds. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 2019 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and explore the hypergrid tour resources in OSCC Expo 2 region along with the sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. And let's see, check on the schedule just real quick to make sure I was correct on that. Actually, it's Dieter Hain, yep, with Into the Future Web-Based Worlds. Thank you, and have a great conference. <music>